Hi, my name is Joe Daniels, and I'm going to show you some work that was done in collaboration between the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, where I work, and Karen Osborne's group at the Smithsonian. Karen Osborne is also the one who provided many of the images in this presentation. All right, let's get into it. I'll be talking about this swimming marine polychaete, Tomopteris. Tomopteris is one of several taxa of gelatinous polychaetes that are holopelagic. This means they spend their entire life cycles in the water column. You can see this resulted in a variety of body types, from short and stout to long and slender, and with an array of appendages developed for propulsion or maneuverability. And feeding strategies are also diverse, uh, which likely drove some of these taxa to evolve as effective swimmers more so than others. Of this ensemble, Tromopter stands out with its long, fleshy appendages that are called peripodia, and has some of the most interesting swimming behaviors. To show you what I mean, here's a video clip taken by a remotely operated vehicle showing a red gut Tomopteris. The general body plan is dominated by the long, fleshy peripodia. Tomopteris has no chidae, despite being a polychaete, and they may or may not have a long tail, so as you can see here. Some Tomopterids can grow up to a meter in length. As you can see, it's an effective and elegant swimmer, and one thing to note in this video is that the movement of the peripodia is entirely in the body plane, not rowing up and down. Uh, like the crawling or rowing motion of other polychaetes. And if you look carefully, you can distinguish two main elements to the swimming motion. The first one is a body wave uh, or undulation traveling forward towards the head, and the second one is the movement of the parapodia. I'll start by comparing these two observations to some other swimming animals you might know. First, let's take a look at that body wave. Uh, body waves are uh, really common in swimming animals, uh, as most fish and a range of invertebrates undulate their bodies in some way or other. In the graph here, I'm showing amplitude of the body wave along the vertical axis and V over U on the horizontal axis, which stands for the animal speed divided by the body wave speed. And in this case, V over U will be positive if the body wave travels towards the tail of the animal. Well, let's take Amari's mascot, the gulper eel, as an example. Um, and in this video, you can see that the animal swims to the left, but the body wave actually travels towards the tail of the animal. In the plot, I'm showing two animals right at V over U equals 1, which means that the body wave travels backwards as fast as the animal travels forward. And this gives the appearance of a stationary wave, uh, much like the typical motion of a snake on land. The Venus girdle is the tinafore that Brad Gemmel uh, discussed in his talk in this symposium. That's why I'm pointing that out here. Um, both eel-like and sa salmon-like fish end up at the same V over U. That seems weird at first, but the body wavelength is quite different between the two, uh, and this graph just simply doesn't capture that well. Um, all these rearward body waves work well for animals with smooth bodies, where there isn't too much drag when the more posterior part glides through the water as the animal moves forward. For animals with lots of appendages, such as worms, this isn't the case. Um, their bodies are effectively kind of rough. There, the drag on the more posterior segments is used to push off and propel the front of the body more like a caterpillar than a snake. This results in a forward-moving wave, as you can see in the Tomopterid in this little video in the top left. This applies to several swimming worms, including Tomopterids, scale worms, and swimming by uh, narrative-form worms. And if you know of any non-polychaete swimmers with a forward-directed body wave, I'd love to hear of it. The literature on swimming worms is focused on these nearid worms. Um, these papers are based on undulation of rough bodies. And for nearids, this is a reasonable approximation. Uh, their appendages are so small that they're assumed to have a little or of a direct effect. But you can see in this little video, uh, how aggressive the swimming actually looks for a nereus. It's not quite elegant and effective like Tomopteris. Um, also, most nereids are primarily crawlers and burrowers, and they can swim short bouts, uh, but this isn't really a great model for the Tomopteris body wave that we're looking at over here. And going back to the graph from before, you can see where these nereids sit. Um, it seems their motion requires either a much larger amplitude or a different wave velocity compared to Tomopterus, making kind of a poor model for what we're looking at here. We'll come back to this body wave in a few minutes, but let's have a look at the peripodium motion first and see how Tomopterus compares to other metachronal swimmers. Here I'm comparing the metachronal motion of various taxa. I'm showing the number of propulsors on the x-axis 
uh, and on the y-axis uh, is the propulsor size relative to body size. And we see that the animals from different phyla are largely grouped together. Uh, I added some of the crustaceans that were discussed in other tox talks in this session and the complementary sessions, including the manta shrimp you heard about from uh, Kuvad Guryev. As you can see, some of the best swimming polygeids ended up together, and they look alike at first sight, such as scale worms and swimma over here. Of these swimmers, uh, Tomopteris is the only one with the fleshy parapodia and a lack of kitty. Most other, other polychaetes are primarily crawlers or burrowers or sedentary and may have many more segments and therefore end up way on the right in this plot. Uh, Osteopids are a pretty unique exception with over 100 super tiny parapodia. Uh, in terms of propulsor size and body length, Many Tomopterids aren't too far off from many crustacean species, which typically have fewer swimming legs and an entirely different symmetry. One thing crustaceans can't do very well uh, is a body wave. And uh, so while there's a lot of literature on metachromal paddling in krill, it isn't really directly applicable for, for the worm we're looking at. Taking a step back, uh, at, uh, looking at the theory behind metachronal swimming modes, the main requirement is non-reciprocal motion, which means the forward motion isn't the same as the rearward motion, otherwise you just get back and forth movement. The image on the left here shows a simplified rigid body with a number of legs. You can see sequential power stroke, so one by one these legs uh, paddle backwards, and a simultaneous recovery. And on the right here, you can see what a plot of, of the leg angle over time looks for two adjacent legs in red and blue. They're shifted in phase during the power stroke and then move together in recovery stroke upward at the end of the plot. Now for sinusoidal paddling, all legs move at the same time, but out of sync. One limitation of this can be the total angular sweep without collision. And the graph of angles is sinusoidal and identical for each leg, just phase shifted. Many invertebrates actually have a more or less modified sinusoidal wave, and an example of such a ametrochronal wave can be found in the remipedes, shown in a little image over here. Now let's look at what Tomopteris is really doing. The swimming legs of Tomopteris uh, consist of a somewhat tapered cylindrical trunk with two rami supporting fleshy pinnules that act as paddles, and they can move relative to each other. Tomopters have about 25 pairs of these, uh, varying slightly in size along the body. And it's worth noting that these animals consist of a single hydrostatic unit with no septa, meaning that the inside of all the parapodia is connected. In order to study this motion in more detail, we collected several tomopterids. Uh, the animals were collected in Monterey Bay um, using remotely operated vehicles. Here you can see Ambari's Western Flyer, which deploys the ROV duck rickets. Once down several hundred meters, we looked for tomopterids, got some in-situ video of these animals in their natural habitat, and then slurped them up for more data collection in the ship-based or shore-based lab. Here you can see a picture of one of the setups. Uh, you can see a high-speed camera looking down into a tank with an animal, and we either illuminate from behind for bright field imaging, or from the side with a laser for particle image photosymmetry. And an example clip is shown here on the right, where you can see a tomopterid swimming uh, freely through the vessel, and you can already see both the body wave and the parapodium motion pretty clearly. To quantify this, uh, we digitized landmarks in a number of clips. 52 points were tracked for each frame for, the, for all these clips. And I want to thank the undergrads at the Smithsonian who helped out with this very time-consuming task. As a result, we ended up with a lot of track data points, which gave us a good starting point for some more analysis. First off, let's look at this body wave. Using the points tracking the tips and the base of the parapodia, we were able to tease out the body wave uh, and a midline through the body. So the body wave is in red and the midline is the blue dashed line here. And you can clearly see that with the head on the left, the body wave travels towards the head. Looking at this body wave in more detail for 20 clips, we see the following. First off, we see eight to 12 segments per body wave. Uh, in the plot on the right, you can see how the relative amplitude changes with the relative speed of the animal. And here I'm showing uh, the results for 20 clips where each of these markers uh, shows a different clip. The size indicates the size of the animal, the color uh, indicates the species, and the shape is different for each individual. What we see here is that the amplitude and frequency increase with swim speed. 
And also that larger animals tend to move with smaller relative amplitude and frequency, but at similar absolute speeds. So there seems to be a correlation between body wave properties and speed, indicating that it contributes to swimming. Now, what about those large parapodia? Well, we can look at those as well, uh, using the track points on the base and the tips of the parapodia. We can now plot the angle of the parapodia relative to their resting state. This is what that looks like. Looking at two adjacent parapodia, the angle changes nearly sinusoidally over time. It's not perfect compared to the dashed blue sine wave, but it certainly is close. The power stroke, which is the downward slope, is slightly faster, but I'll get that back to that in a minute. We can also see that the graphs are essentially the same, just with a phase delay and a slight shift in an angular sweep, depending on the distance to the head, which you can see here as a slight offset in the vertical direction. Now, how is this sinusoidal paddling affected by also having a body wave? First off, we can see that the body wave enhances the peripodial thrust by allo allowing a larger range of motion than in the case of a rigid body with stiff legs. In addition, because it is synchronized to the peripodium frequency, the body wave pushes the peripodia out in the power stroke while tucking them in in the recovery stroke. In the little figure here on the left, the dashed lines indicate the extent of the peripodia if there was no body wave at all. And you can clearly see the tips of the peripodia are extending beyond those lines. And as a result, we can see this as a change in the effective length of the parapodia. And that's what I'm showing in the plot on the right, where you can see the increase of the effective length um, with the increase of re relative amplitude. And this effect can be more than 20% and help position the pineal tips further out to more effectively push off against the surrounding water. In order to see just how Stomopterus generate thrust, it is important to figure out if the parapodia are actively moved or simply flutter around as a result of the body wave. To find out, we compare the angle of the parapodia to the local body angle, which is indicated here with this orange line. Um, what you'd expect if the parapodium motion is passive is that the parapodium angle trails the local body angle. Here we are plotting exactly that over time with the local body angle. In blue, and the peripodium angle in red. You can see that the minimum, which indicates the start of the recovery stroke in each graph, uh, comes a little bit earlier for the peripodium than for the body. And this means that the peripodia are actively pulled towards the head in the recovery stroke. During the power stroke, the peripodium angle also gets ahead of the local body angle. And at the same time, the peripodium uh, tips move faster than the surrounding water which can only happen if there's an active power stroke as well. So the parapodia provide additional thrust on top of what the body wave provides. One thing that is not well captured by analyzing the points that retract is the flexibility of the parapodia during the stroke. The trunk is flexible, the pinules can be cupped, um, and the rami can be spread. Looking at this into a little bit more detail, uh, we can see a PIV clip here in the bottom left, looking laterally at Tomopteris. Uh, you can see that during the power stroke, when the parapodia moves to the right, the pineal spread outward, providing more purchase in the water. Looking at some numbers here, uh, plotting the rami spread over time, we can see that, uh, that this can be about 40% over the recovery stroke, changing the surface area of the parapodia by about the same amount, and therefore the thrust as well. I also want to point out that the maximum rami spread uh, that happens is right in the middle of the power stroke. And that's when the body wave brings the parapodia out the furthest as well for maximum effect. Now, what this, does this mean for the fluid interactions on the parapodium level? Sean Collin has a nice talk in the complimentary se session 12 about this interaction, discussing a recent paper. And I'm showing one figure here from that paper on the left here. Uh, which is based on PIV in Tomopteris. We can see three parapodia where the head is towards the top, the tail is towards the bottom. And apparently a negative pressure region is generated at the leeward side of the parapodia, the top of the parapodia here, um, effectively pulling the animal forward, as shown by the light blue arrows that indicate pull thrust. In a way, the animal therefore seems to be pulling itself forward rather than pushing. Zooming out to the scale of the whole animal, we can see our data shows something similar. 
And here's some raw PIV data. If you focus on a point to the right uh, of one of the parapodia as it starts the power stroke, you can see particles that are trapped there rolling off the parapodia, being propelled towards the back, never touching another parapodium again. And this indicates the transfer of momentum to the fluid. If you look at the absolute speed of the fluid, you can see these little streams resulting from each power stroke uh, coming out. There's certainly more to this, uh, and that's where computational fluid dynamics might provide some answers. Our collaborator, Alex Hoover, is presenting some results on his initial work in session 13 uh, of a fluid dynamics model for these parapodia. And this approach will hopefully give us a better sense of efficiency of the motion as well uh, that we're really interested in. Karen Osborne has been looking at the musculature inside these fleshy parapodia and just how it differs from other polychaetes, which may use kiti as paddles instead. The takeaway here is that the motion of a swimming teropteris takes an integrative approach using different methods to look at different elements of the propulsion. And one thing we are just beginning to look at is how the flexibility of the body and the parapodia might make a difference in propulsion compared to, for example, crustaceans. Either way, even if the, in the mysterious midwater, tomopters really do stand out with a mode of propulsion that's not like any other polychaete or perhaps really any other animal down there. And with a forward directed body wave to increase the effectiveness of the large parapodia that are actively involved in swimming. There are even a few behaviors that I haven't touched on, such as the agility of this animal and the fact that it can swim backwards pretty well too. That's all. I just want to thank our collaborators and coworkers, our funding agencies, and everyone who helped with this project. And I'm really looking forward to your comments.